What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Fit Fat Dad Podcast, the podcast where it's two dads, myself, Graham, and Blair, who are kind of fit, kind of fat, talking all things dad. Wow, we have a show for you today, bringing in special guest, Dr. Jeremy Towns. Talk about motivational talk about inspiring, talk about all the things that are going to make you feel triumphed, overcome. He is the dude. Guy wakes up spitting fire every morning, ready to go. And we're going to get into that interview and I'm super excited to share it with you. Let me give you a little history on our special guest today. So Dr. JT Jeremy Towns, uh, signed a free agent deal with the Washington Redskins the day before he was going to go to medical school. Uh, and this is after spending his career at Sanford University, the Sanford University, my alma mater, where he played defensive tackle, overcame multiple season-ending injuries. Uh, and this is after playing just one season of high school football. So the guy has lived an absolute journey. Uh he talks a little bit today about his uh, path in the NFL, where God led him, gave him vision uh, to ultimately go into medical school, becoming a doctor, raising up multiple campus ministries called Ransom. Man, the guy is just on fire. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right into that interview. You, JT, I need you to get me lit. I need you to get me amped. <laughs> Let's, Let's start it off, it. baby. Hey, there's no complaining. There's no excuses today. I need you to get it. Just get me going. Let's, Let's go. go. Let's do it. What you what you, what you got for me? What is the like? All right, I'm kind of like on the bench. It's the fourth quarter. I'm tired. Right. It, it's been we've been going back and forth a little bit. I'm feeling sorry for myself, but we got one drive left to go. JT, what are you telling me? I'm telling you is now or never. Like. Uh, I've been having some opportunities to talk and speak to people. And what I what I always challenge men with is a legacy. You know, with, with the type of ministry I do, it's, it's just in your face. It's honest. It's guys who might be dealing with fornication. They might be dealing yeah. with, you know, all these different things. And I tell them, you know, a man's flesh always want, is going to want to do whatever it wants to do. Whether yep. it's that, you know, have sex out of marriage. Let's, you know, do things that they know they shouldn't do. Uh, or just be weak. And what I always tell people is like, you know, what about legacy? And one of the things that even kept me going uh, through going for the NFL, and I remember I was there with one of my friends, uh, Kelsey Pope, who now coaches, oh, shoot, with Tennessee. He's wide receiver coach yeah. in Tennessee. Yeah. And he was uh, asking, he was like, man, what, what makes you kind of go to the next level with your mindset, even when – Nobody's around or whatever. And I told him I had this, this epiphany one day is that I don't have kids, but I always think about if I have a son, his name is going to be JT Jr. That's and I was like, one day JT Jr. is going, I'm going to try to encourage him. And he's going to say, you know what, dad, you know, you didn't always wake up excited. There were some days you took off. There were some days where you said, poor me. I, I mean, I, I have tomorrow. And I was like, he's going to, go through uh my plays in life and i was like mm -hmm. i call it the invisible camera theory of phenomenal camera. And it's like if he could just go through plays in my life he'd say dad you know on this day you didn't have it you like every other day you had it but this this particular day you just didn't have it and so i started trying to live my life for you know jt jr who i don't even have a kid but i was yeah. like you know <laughs> one day when i do i want him to realize like Man, hey, daddy gave it all every single day. And all these plays, as you know well, with football and all of that, at the end of the day, it don't matter. You know, no. it's easy to do that. I tell I, I tell the guys all the time that I'm around, it's like when you got a certain number of people cheering for you in the stadium, well, it's easy to go hard that play. When you got a strength coach that's on your butt and, you know, every, any guy that comes through college, they start getting a little yoke. They start feeling themselves. And it's like, but you had a strength coach. Like, you were going to become that regardless. And so I always say, man, it, the test of a man is when he doesn't have to go 
uh, at a certain level. And then there's another story. I was with, uh, I had my football camp and I was trying to print shirts for the camps. I printed myself so I can give these shirts to the kids for free and keep the camp free for the kids. And I had agreed to go talk to my high school basketball coaches team, basketball team. And I got there right on time. I mean, literally right on time. And he said, he called me twins. I have a twin brother. He was like, twin, I was betting on you. He said, I would have bet the last dollar in my wallet that you would have been here on time. And I was like thinking like, dang, man, I almost didn't make it on time. And so yeah. He started giving me this like feedback that like, man, I got to be at my level. Uh, I got to be at the level that I'm supposed to be at every single doggone day. And yeah. some days you won't be there, but you got to be at the best level you can be for that particular day. And that's what, man, that's what really fuels me and gets me going on a whole nother level now. Because I tell people the outcomes used to be tackles, tackles for a lot of sacks. Mm -hmm. But when I'm not at my best, uh, you know, especially being in the merch department, people's lives are on the line. Yeah. And then even in the community, you know, I might get one chance to speak to somebody to change their life around. If I'm not ready at that moment, uh, you know, not that it's my fault, but I still, you know, I didn't meet my expectation. That's what I tell people is, they was like, you know, are you trying to live for other people? I'm like, no, it's it's my own expectation of myself that I'm trying to live up to every day. Ultimately, I try to live to what God's expectation of me is. And so yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is good. Hey, you turn it around, man. I, we so you know, hey, I, I'll shoot you some links and get you caught up on the the Fit Fat Dad. We call that game film. We watch the game film, and that's the game film of life. It's so true, man. It's like if all right, because I mean, obviously, you know. And the eye in the sky never lies. And if we looked at that with our life, right? Like if we had to review what we did on a daily basis in secret, in public, whatever, like God sees everything, man. Like, are we honoring him and, and not? So I love how you just teed that up right there. That flows exactly with everything, man. That That's good. So, all right. I'm going to make you a little bit uncomfortable because I, I don't take Jeremy Towns as the guy who likes to talk about himself, but like, mm -hmm. You have done so much like you. When I think of like God's purpose in someone's life, you are all in like you are all about it. I don't even know how you sleep at night. You are just so lit all the time, like you're getting after it. So uh, for those listening, give us a little background of, of who Jeremy Towns is. And and there's so much to, to unpack there. But just tell us tell us a little bit about Jeremy Towns. So uh, I grew up in a, a single parent home. My dad was there initially and he left addicted to drugs and alcohol. And when I kind of look at it, you know, I don't blame him anymore. I used to blame him. Now I blame the situation and the choices. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my mother, she's a kick butt type of woman, man. She's different. You know, uh, we would be fighting in the house. And I mean, and it's, it's a lose-lose if you get to fight as a brother. I mean, we know that now as men, but even back then, I mean, the person's winning, she's going to start. If she tells you to stop and you don't stop, she's jumping on whoever's winning. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it's like, you know, i never forget one of my brothers the next day was like, ah, ah, like my ribs. And I was like, yeah, mama was winning your, your ribs out. You didn't stop. You didn't stop. And yeah, she started. She got in there and got after it. But uh, uh, when I look at it, even though growing up in a single parent home and when my dad left, we went from middle class to really impoverished. Yeah. And I tell people that sucks because you know, what's better. You you know what having more looks like, and then you don't have, mm -hmm. but later on, I would say that I was entitled. And the reason I say that is because even though I didn't have my father in the household, I had my oldest brother in the household and, he had a level of grit and a level of tenacity that was just uncommon. And a lot of the attributes that I had today is uh, because of him. Like he would say, you know, things. And I'm like nine or 10 years old. And this guy's telling me, you know, a gazelle gets up and have to, uh, you said a, che a cheetah gets up and have to run away from the fastest tiger in the jungle. And now I'm seeing all type of motivational speakers saying that phrase now. But back then, before social media was popular, he was telling me these type things. And, he would tell me if you didn't work today, and it was primarily when I was just a basketball player. He was like, "You'll never catch up." He's like, you, "You'll never get that play back." He was like, "Don't worry about it." He always talked to me like this. Don't worry about it. He took a day off, 
But he says somebody worked the day that you didn't work. And he yeah. says, you can't go to work tomorrow and catch up with that guy because he's going to work tomorrow also. And so I have a, a middle brother named uh, Andre, oldest brother's name, DJ, middle brother named Andre. I have a twin brother named Jared. And he's kind of like you're all around just he's the flash and glamour. I mean, basketball player, you know, he was the man in high school, you know, and, mm-hmm. and he still got that mentality. He just liked being the man, you know. I, I call him now and I'm telling me I ran into somebody at uh, the mall and they were telling me, uh, reminding me about when we played in high school. And he'll let you go on and on. He's like, what they said again? He just want to hear you talk about him again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, we grew up middle school, high school, went to Winona High School. And uh, my mother just had this kick butt mentality. I mean, you can't stay at the house. So you got to go to college. You got to go to trade school. I never forget my brother. He went to Alabama out of high school mm-hmm. on scholarship, and then it was some riffraff. He didn't jail well with the new coaching staff, or you know, just really wasn't for him down there. And he came home, and he's like, you know, I'm just stay at home and get fat. And I and I tend to take his side on this. So you know, he's going through a lot. Yeah. But he stood up, and he was trying to walk past my mama, and she kind of. Gave him one of these. She knocked him into a china cabinet. Let's and go. I said, <laughs> I said, man, this is, as a kid, I'm thinking this got to be the craziest thing ever. His arm bleeding a little bit, and people asked me about it. It was like, did he go to college? I was like, of course. I mean, the dude almost getting beat up at home. He got to go. You know, he could <laughs> went ahead and finished with Montebello, finished in the Hall of Fame. But I think the defining thing for me was, uh, you know, getting to go to Sanford and get my life changed yeah. with the gospel. You know, I was a pretty good guy, but what's a good guy when you know, end up knowing Jesus, you realize, man, everything else is filthy rags. And so a guy on the football team named Jamal Lett, who I just heard now is coaching at North Carolina. Uh, yeah. I remember Jamal. I play with Jamal. You play with Jamal? Oh. I play with Jamal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. He changed my life. He Jamal started walking around, and it's so funny with, like, this podcast being directed towards men and yep. really loving on men and making men better. Jamal would be like, I love you, man. And he would be like, and I love that guy. We'll be talking about other guys. He'd be like, I really love that guy. At first I was like, hold on, Jamal. Like, you can't just be saying you love men. And then, you know, <laughs> next thing you know, I caught myself saying it. Cause what yeah. he taught me is that there's a real genuine love, man, that you can have for another guy. And that love makes him better. Yeah. And, you know, Jamal pushed me at a level that he ended up telling me, he was like, you know, you'll go to the NFL, you'll go to med school, you'll make it cool to be a Christian. And it was so funny. I ended up getting a shot in the NFL, ended up going to medical school. And while I was training for the NFL, it was a guy, a big time guy who was training in Texas. And he told me we had been there like six weeks training. And he was like, they tell you the first guy I've met that can do what's right and still be cool. And I was like, Jamal has had his way of everything he says is just it's fulfilled. But one day I came home, uh, I was coming home from the NFL. Well, actually, I was in medical school and I came home to do the football camp and stuff. And my oldest brother told me, he was like, you hadn't accomplished nothing. I was like, dang, man. If- all this ain't accomplished nothing, then I don't know what, like, I don't know what it is wow. else to accomplish, yeah. but, and, and he ain't even like the most spiritual guy. He, he know God, but he ain't trying to, but what he said was like really very spiritual for me because he let me know, man, all these accolades, what are you going to do? Who are you going to help? And leaving the Eagles, the Eagles has one of the best orientations. Like you don't even need to play football to go through this stuff. It's like, if you're yeah. a business person, you need to go to this orientation, man. It's called Eagles U. They take every single person that comes to their organization through this program. And they tell you about sleep. They tell you about the growth mindset. I mean, they're just hammering you with some stuff. And you're like, man, I should be paying to be here. Yeah. Long story short, I was going through the Eagles U and God kind of just spoke to me and said, you know, you're going to go to all these places. You're going to see all these things. Who are you taking with you? And I was kind of like, ah, God, you know, I'm doing X, Y, but then I just shut up. And that's when I started trying to go hard on another level. And mm. I got this to this point that I said, I tell people, 
I don't at this point, you know, like you said, you know, all these accolades and it, I don't get another notch on my resume. Yeah. The only notch I get now is if I help somebody else. And yeah. so that's what my whole life geared towards now is like if, if I if I get another award, man, it's just it's just another award and a long list of awards. But if I can help somebody else, that's yeah. that's what gets me hungry. Like that's what motivates me. It's like if I can take somebody who said I can't do something like the greatest thing I like hearing is somebody tell them they can't do it. And I'm like, if you just stay around me, we're going to find a way to get you to do it. I was mentoring two people in medical school, which I don't even know how I had time, but we started the ministry ransom down there while I was in medical school. But I ended up mentoring two two people. One of, one of the young ladies, she was like a D student, maybe make C's. And then she started making A's and B's because she was like, I got to know my limitations. Like I, I was told to know my limitations. I'm like, I agree with what that, whoever told you that. That you need to know your limitations. I'm like, let's find them. Like, you can't just say you need to know your limitations without finding them. And yeah. in order to find them, you got to go to the extent of who you are. Then this other guy, which is one of my favorite stories, Nick Mobley. I call him the mob man. This guy's like a drill sergeant. Like, he he's just he just to the T. And I got him out there. Of course, he had some awesome trainers before he ever met me. But I offered some guys in South Alabama. It's like, hey, I'm down here in, in medical school. Come train. I'm like, I'll train with you all. And one guy took me up on it, Nick the Mob Man Mobley. He said, JT, I want to train with you, man. So we would go to the uh, field on Monday, no, on Saturdays at 6 a.m. in the morning. Guy get up here, beat me out there. And I just told him, I said, man, all you got to do is just do the drill. Don't worry about what we're trying to get. But I let him know. I said, hey, I'm trying to get you a scholarship. I just need you to do the drill. I'll worry about the scholarship. Let the scholarship be my part. You just come do the drills. And all I did was train this man's mindset. Mm. And I told him, man, that's what I learned in the NFL. Like, these guys, like, thinking about guys like Jerry Hughes that played defensive end at the Bills, man, the guy would come in an hour, two hours before we needed to be on the field, and he would do an hour uh, pre-practice workout. And so he taught me excellence on another level, like, I was just there, but he was teaching me excellence. He was because he wanted to perform at his best at practice. I had never seen anything like that. I thought practice was when you get better. Yeah. But what he was saying is, I want to be at game speed at by the time I get at practice. And so I started putting Nick Mobile on it. And I was just telling him, man, like, you're a walk on. They don't respect you. They can't respect you. You haven't done anything for them to respect you. And I was like, they're going to run the ball at you. You're a middle linebacker, and you're a walk-on here, so they're going to run the ball at you. And so every drill we would do, I would just get him in the mind frame. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, go through the icky shuffle, burst off the ladder. Well, he would give me the icky shuffle, and then he went burst off the ladder. And finally, it got to the point where he got it down. And long story short, I run into this guy going across the parking lot while they were in camp, and he was like, JT, man, he was like, Nick Mobley hit somebody so hard at practice, the coach had to stop practice. <laughs> and I was like, dang. And I always told Nick, I was, I, I ended up finding, I was like, Nick, I heard what they said, man. I was like, they're going to run the ball at you again because that was a fluke. Another person stopped me and it was like, Nick Mobley hit somebody so hard at the end of practice that they just coughed up the ball. He's not going to do that out of him, man. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I was like, bro, you only get one shot. So you can't be saying, I'm going to get this play. If I mess up this play, I get another one. You only get the plays that you're out there. That's it. And Nick ended up uh, getting a full scholarship, <laughs> end up starting, end up leading the team into tackles in the history books now at South Alabama. And so when he got ready to stop playing football because he had a neck injury, he could just stop playing football, and now he's an engineer. Yeah, that's so good. So I'll – I want to hit two things you said, right? So uh, you've not accomplished anything, right? Like that's what a humbling experience and, and to have that spoken into you because I mean, let's, let's face it, like played D one football, overcame injuries, went to the Buffalo bills, right? The NFL. And you said you went to the Eagles. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Washington, Buffalo, and the Eagles. Yeah, man. So, all right, you're already in the point zero 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 one percent of everybody. Not to mention med school, a doctor, and then starting Ransom Ministries, which 
How many universities is Ransom started at now? He said he said four now working on five. Yeah. So to hear that, what a humbling experience. But you're right. Like it's all for the glory of God. And and I think a lot of the times we can get very self like <clears throat> this is Graham doing it or it's JT doing it. We're the ones doing it and we forget the purpose behind it. And hey, we're human. We talked about the flesh earlier. The flesh gets in the way. And it's easy to like, I think that's where the enemy comes and attacks us and says, Hey, look, JT, this is all you, man. You did it all. How, and, and you could have had the posture to like, bro, I've done it. Like you haven't accomplished anything, but you didn't, you took the challenge and you just continued to speak life and bring people along with you, which is just such a, it's such a great thing to do. And I think that's just, um, a great testament to you, but just also like the, the power of, of how God leads people, right? Like, Hey, he takes our yoke, he takes our burden and he gives us more energy than we could have ever imagined. And and that's, Hey, it's truly only God, because when I, when I look at you and everything that you do, I don't know how you, like I said, I don't know how you function because I mean, you're a doctor and you're leading ministries and you're always, you're always bringing somebody along with you. Um, so that that's just that's just awesome, man. Um, you know, and I, I got all into that. I'll, I'll tell you, I have to to remember what the other thing I was going to say to to bring back up to you. The other point I was going to make, but um, dude, that that's just such a great great story. So all right, so I want to switch here um, a little bit. So let's talk about life after the NFL. Now you're officially Doctor Towns, is that correct? Yes, all sir. right. I want to call you DR baby, DR Towns. So in, in your, your emergency doctor, right? So you're in the emergency room. Is emergency. That a, yes, sir. So you see all sorts of things and there's, I mean, you've seen a lot and, and I've just from personal experience, when I've felt closest to God or felt his presence, it's in that those kind of like moments of life and death when things are hanging in the balance and it's a peaceful thing. But talk to me about that. Like, give me your perspective of being a doctor, seeing some of the worst of the worst incidents. And like, how does God speak to you in, in those moments? How is God in the room with the other people? Like describe that experience. Cause that is just a, that is a perspective that not a lot of people have. And if they do, they're not connected to have awareness to actually see it. Um, so somebody like you talk, talk to me about your feelings, your, your thoughts. How do you like, what do you feel in that room? So I guess one thing with being a doctor, I try to go to work every single day with an attitude check, you know, that I don't, uh, I don't have to go. I don't gotta go. I get to go. Yeah, And I got that from the NFL, you know, in the NFL, I was at one point, I was just always worried when I'm going to get cut, if I'm going to get cut. And I started realizing I'm not even enjoying the process of being here. I'm just worried about the next step. And then one day I realized, no, nope, I'm going to milk it. I'm going to have as much fun as I can. I'm not going to stress about it. I'm going to leave it in the, in the Lord's hand and I'm just going, I'm going to have fun. And that's what I do. I start. I, I did that in medical school. I used to call it theme park life. I mean, every single day, I would just envision like a. I was like, I've never seen a kid upset at a, at a theme park. You, I mean, a kid a, 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 a belly over throwing up. Once they're stable from throwing up, they get back and they want to get on another ride. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. I need to, I need to treat med school like this every single day. Med school got to deal with me, and then I just took that into residency because what people would tell me is like, JT, you're gonna burn out. And I would just have this mindset. It's like they tell me I'm burn out. I'm like, I don't have to burn out though. Like, why burn out? Like, you don't have to. I'm like, I'm not even going to put that as a part of what's capable of happening to me. And so I used to say things like, I'll make burnout burnout, but I'm not going to burn out. I'm like, I because it's a mindset. I'm like, I'll flip it. Like, especially if you at least, and I, and I think people are telling me you I'll burn out because then I can make sure it doesn't happen. And so that allows me when I'm in a room is that. You know, I, I want them to get me at my best. And there's plenty of times where, you know, I'm like, dang, I wish I'd have got to that fast. I wish I'd have got to this fast. I thought about this. But what I what I, what I always try to make sure I do is I try to give my best. Every single day, yeah. I want every patient to get my best. And not just clinically, but I want them to have a, a positive interaction with me. The way I talk to them, the way I make them feel, uh, that I want them to know that, uh 
even if they don't know God, the Bible says uh, they'll know with his disciples by our love. So I'm like, I want to love people in a way that they say there's something different about that doctor. Mm -hmm. He treated me different. He looked at me different. He when he when he checked my pulse, he checked it a little differently. His voice was calming. Uh, he I, I could tell that guy was for me. And so as it relates to the merge department, you know, you, you see the worst of humanity sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I check myself and I just always remember no one woke up, no one awakened that day to say, hey, I'm going to make Dr. Town's life the worst it could be today. Yeah. Like that's that's not their that's not their their intention. And so when it comes to it, I try to let stuff just shrug off my shoulder, just bounce off my shoulder, roll off my shoulder. But one of the things I have for myself is uh well two things. One is that my one of my attendants I really look up to is the program director at UAB said, you know, uh we wanna uh basically uh relieve suffering. He said, we might not be able to heal people. We might not be able to make their disease process go the way, but we can relieve suffering. And so uh, that's one of my big things is that, you know, you come in, you might have cancer. But the one thing I can do is I can I can get you some pain meds. And what some people say is, well, when you give them pain meds, it, the pain is going to come back. But if you talk to a cancer patient, some of these people will say, uh, I just want to be out of pain for 10 minutes. Like, yeah. I know you can't keep the pain all the way away, but I just want to be out of pain for 10 minutes. And the other thing is this, is that I tell people I want to be at my best on people's worst days of their life. Mm -hmm. Because we see these things in the emergency department every single day. But it comes down to, to uh, other people, it's their first time ever interacting in the emergency department. And yeah. so... I try to be at my best. And one of the things I do is if I have a patient that comes in and they're coding when they come in, if we don't get them back, I pray for them. I stop the room and I pray, I pray for them because as a doctor, you get that opportunity to be able to uh, say, Hey, this is how, uh, this is how I want this ran. And I always, I always say, if I ever had the opportunity to run the show, how I want to run the show. The thing I would do is before the staff runs and try to take care of the next patient, Let's pray for that patient. And I've had times where it was people I knew. Uh, one time it was a person that, that uh, uh, my family knew, uh, this kid that passed away. And we were going to the and It was something about it. I just sat there and took a moment of silence with, the, uh, with this person. And later found out it was a family friend. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's, well, I've seen that so many times and uh, that type of thing that I'm like, I gotta just treat everybody like they're my family. Yeah. If I treat everybody like they're my family, then I don't have to worry about trying to go back and make it better. I just want to get it right the first time. So uh, I try to pray before I go into work, and I try to realize like I'm God's representative in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's so good. So uh, you said something about, and, and this has actually been spoken to me in in my life, and and it's been a great reminder is. Um, I had a, a guy just come from random and he came into my office one day and uh, it's a much longer story, part of my testimony, but he said, man, you got God on you. Like you don't, you don't know it, but people see it wow. and you got to shine it, man. Like you got to shine God's light because people aren't looking at you. They see God. And, and I've noted like, Hey, majority of the times it's Graham in the flesh and, and you get that. But like when I'm, when God is on me and I see the way people look, man, I'm like, they're not looking at me. They see God. And that's just been like a reminder. And, and I know that, uh, same for you, like God is on you all the time, man. Like you can see it, you can see him radiating and, and to be a patient in like, like you said, the worst time of their life or an extreme accident with a worry, not knowing, you know, if their family member is going to make it or if they're going to make it or what's wrong, they see God on you. And that's just such a like, you know, you, you're more in the metal community community than I am. But it, it's very, at least from my experience, it's very rare that you have a doctor that you, for fear of getting sued or, or like litigation, whatever, will will speak openly about faith. And, and I've ran into quite a few that are very open about that. And I'm like, 
let's freaking go, man. Like, that's awesome. Like, I love that. So that's you, again, that's just another way of that. You're, you're changing lives out there. Uh, so, Hey, I want to go to the NFL, right? That that's a, that's so cool. Like that's to me, that's like action figure. Cool. Like as a kid, like I had all my NFL action figures <laughs> and that was my goal, but you know, it, it didn't, it didn't pan out for me. Uh, so talk to me about life in the NFL. What was that like? It was awesome. Some days I tell, I tell people some days when I would wake up, it's the best day of your life. You're like, wow, I'm here. Some days you wake up and you say, is this it? Like I put all this into the, into, into this moment. But when I look at it, you know, someone talked me into playing football a week and a half before the first game my senior year in high school. And there was a lot of schools looking at me, and then they heard I had really only played one year of football. So uh, they backed off. Coach Sullivan calls me the summer uh, right before uh, the fall year I should be presenting to fall camp, and it was late. And I got there a day before uh, camp was about to start. And then I have two season into injuries in, in college. I mean, back to back. I, the first injury uh, was a sports hernia. And I came back and I was playing the best ball I have, had ever played. And uh, that was just in spring. And then uh, I, I had been out a whole year. And then I come to right before it's time, like right as we were about to get out of fall camp and go into the season, someone gets thrown into my leg. I'm out for another season. And so for me, it was just a blessing to get to the NFL. I mean, just to even smell a piece of the NFL. But mm. when I got, before I went there, i never forget I was in the science center at Sanford. And I was calling agents and I would say, I will give them my stats and they would be interested. And I would say, uh, Sanford University. And they'll say, you know, this is literally what they tell me. I never get this guy say, call me if you need some help. Like, that's why I'm calling you. I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone because I, I need help. But yeah, I remember I was about to give up. And this is one of the most life-changing moments of my life because I was about to give up. And then I chuckled a little bit because I just felt something. I was like, God told me, I want you to go on this journey because I'll teach you something you otherwise would not learn. Mm -hmm. So I realized that it was about the journey more than the destination. Mm -hmm. And that he was going to teach me some things along the way. And so uh, I remember going to Ricky mini camp with the, with the jets, then make it on. And I was like, that's their miss. Isn't it? it I mean, it's all good. They, they wanted different people. That's okay. I'm just going to keep, you know, chipping away at, at the block. And uh, it got up to the right before the time to go to med school. Uh, the Washington uh, football team, that it's called now hit me up and they were asking me about, could I, uh, well, no, let's rewind. So I went on this mission trip with Marnu in the athletic department. And I told my mother before we went on a trip, I said, when I'm, I'm going on this trip. I told my mama, a team don't call me. She was like, no, go on this trip. You, you already went Jets for Ricky Minicamp. Go on this trip and then just come back home. And so I was like, okay. She was like, no, go on this trip, come back home. I'm gonna take you right to med school. So I went on this trip. I land in Atlanta airport and I'm checking my messages. And I guess Martin Noon could tell that something was wrong with my facial expression. He was like, what's going on? I was like, well, uh, Washington called me a day after we left. And he was like, call him back. And I was like, ah, man, I don't really want to deal with this. I'm going to go ahead and go to med school. I mean, it's all good. And so I called him back out of obedience, and the guy didn't answer. And it's like it was a bit of relief for me because I could just move on. And he ended up texting me and saying, hey, uh, I'm in a meeting. I'll call you back. And I was like, dang, now I'm back in this cycle of trying to just wait, playing the waiting game. Phone tag, and, yeah. Yeah, this phone tag thing. and. Uh, they end up calling me and it was like, hey, we're going to bring you up this day. Well, they usually had workouts on Tuesdays when they want to try you out. So this was a, this was, a, uh, it got up until Monday. I'm like, there's no way they're going to fly me in Tuesday morning. I don't even have a flight. And so 
I knew at the end of that week, it was time to go to medical school. So the day before I was about to go to medical school, I got everything handled in town. All my college leaders, I got them squared away before I was finna hit the mobile to medical school. And I feel this, I was about to, I had an SD card in his phone. So I was gonna put some music on the SD card for my drive down the mobile. And I felt this vibration. And I was like, hold on, is my phone finna crump out on me, man? Like, what are the odds that like, hey, I'm about yeah. to go to medical school, my phone about to crump. I turn it around, it's vibrating because the Redskins are called at the time called Redskins. And so uh, I, I answer it and the guy says, can you come up? I was like, no, I got to speak. Like, I can't fly out today. I got to go speak to this youth group. And I called and told my mother what I, what I told the scout. And she ended up uh, calling my pastor. And my pastor called me and was like, uh, I, want you to, I want you to call them back and tell them that you will come and I'll go speak to the youth group. I was like, Pastor, that ain't how it works. They go to the next guy. Again, out of obedience, I called them back. They uh, they flew me up. But my mother later tells the story differently. She was like, I thought you were playing the entire time because you said that this was ha- going to happen. And she was like, it was almost surreal. Like you said it was going to happen, and then here it was happening. She was like, I thought you were pulling my leg the whole time. Even when I dropped you off at the airport, I thought you were playing. I was kind of waiting for you to call me back. But about three hours, I was at home for about three hours. I was like, you know, I guess this is real. And I called my friend because I was going to Washington. She grew up in the area. And so she was like, you'll meet my pastor. And so this was a Caucasian young lady. And I was like, okay, I'll meet your pastor when I get up there. But I was like, I got to make the team first. Yeah. So I'm sitting in this room with this guy uh, in the hotel room with this guy. He came in late. I mean, just it was a different type cat. And so I'm talking to him and he was like, he had three years of pro experience. I'm like, dang, here I am again up against somebody who got more experience than me, all of this. And I just said, you know what? The battle is not mine, it's the Lord's. I had been reading about David and Goliath and David had said, the battle is not mine, it's the Lord's. So I just went to sleep. Next day I wake up, the guy's talking to me. He was like, you know, explaining to me different stuff. He was like, when we go from, and he, he kind of just talked too fast. So I was like, listen, I was like, hold on, what you said, man? He was like, between the drill, he was like, we in the drill, go hard. But between the drills, he was like, take your time. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, bro, no way. Like, no way am I going to take my time. Like, it's, it's, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, but like, yeah. In my mind, I'm like screaming like this. But I just, I'm like, okay, okay. But like, in my mind, I was like, there's no way. I'm like, this guy's depending on my lack of effort for his success. Mm-hmm. Well, I was like, no matter what happens, I know this guy, like, if, they, if it's between us two, he can't, he won't get the spot because he's always trying to, he, he's already trying to find a way out. And me and my friend Nick Williams, we always had this phrase that people try to cut corners on life. It's like people try to cut corners on life, but we'll find out life are gonna cut those same corners on you down the road. Mm. It's just a matter of time before life starts cutting corners on you. And so I was like, this guy's lost. So I just went out there, I was like, I can do anything for 30 minutes. I don't even have to be in shape. I'll be able to do it for 30 minutes. So yeah. I went and worked out and it was so crazy. Like I was always on my grind. So Somehow, uh, I had some ran some business cards from when I had been talking to people, and they were like in my in my pocket. So I had put them in my sock, but then I was like, "Dang, I, I don't want to I don't want to work out with these." So I stuffed them under some rocks when I got out there to the field, and I did my workout, gave it my best, shook everybody's hand, and I was just under the thing impression like, "Man, I'm just glad to be here. Like, it don't even matter. It's not even about me making y'all a team, man." Y'all let me up here. I'm like, for me to even get this opportunity, I was just grateful. And so yeah. I was shaking everybody's hands, and then I tried to wait for a time. They would notice. I dug under the rocks, got my cards. So I'm like, man, this this my life, man. I, I still got to do the rest of this stuff, whether I play football or not. So I got mm-hmm. my record card, business cards, and went inside. And I took the best shower, man. I was like, I'm staying on the couch with my brother. I took the best shower. I mean, it was it was an absolutely great shower. When then they started saying, hey, JT, JT, Towns, hurry up. 
I'm like, man, y'all let me up here, man. I'm enjoying this moment, man. I know, I said, man, I know when I get out, y'all gonna see me back to Birmingham. And my mom already said, if when I come back, she take me straight to med school. So I just ignored them for a little while, and I was like, man, let me go ahead and get up out of here, man. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. But I was yeah, like, yeah. What feathers are they even to rough, ruffle? Like, man, I'm going. You sending me home anyway? I got out, and they said, hey, Towns, we want to offer you a free agent deal. I was like, wow. I was kind of taken aback. And he was like, and to think about it, you wanted to, you was going to skip this to go speak at a church. And I was so glad he could say that. I was glad that part of my testimony was that he had to realize I was going to skip all of this to go pour into some some young people. And so uh, we went to lunch and then at dinner, the first person I sat down next to was the chaplain of the team. My friend H. B. who had told me that I would meet her pastor up there. It was her pastor there. And it was pretty cool. It's an American man. And I was like, I was thrown off. I was like, hold on. But it's like this multicultural church that she that that she goes to up there. Now she's on staff there. But yeah. it's 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 like that pursuit to get to the NFL, it was it was it was an amazing pursuit because it was all these times where when I was going to train, even before I get I, I got to go to even Ricky Minicamp. Nick Williams helped me pay to go, uh, and my brother, they split it basically to go uh, to Houston to train. Mm -hmm. I drove a 1999 Mercury Villager van all the way to Houston, had a blowout on the way back, got it fixed, came back. But just this grind. But I got to learn so much about God along the way because I started realizing that I'm, I'm always listening to what other people say and not God's report. Like, what does God have to say? And man, while I was there, man, one of the defining things while I was at the Washington football team was the chaplain, he was speaking, he said something super bold. He said, I'm the most blessed man in this room. And my hand in my head, I'm like, no, you're not. No, you're not. Like these guys got way more money than you, man. Like you can't say that. I'm like, but I was intrigued. I was like, what make this guy stand up there? I'm like, bro, you a preacher. Yeah. You're the most blessed man. And so I knew it was my friend's pastor. I went out to talk to him afterwards. And he said, yeah. He said, all my kids know the Lord. And I didn't leave my wife for the mistress of the church. And what he was saying is that he didn't even let church get in the way of his family. And he told me the story of Genesis 18, 19. For God chose Abraham to direct his children and his household in the ways of the Lord. And then he would bring about what was promised. And that's, that's been a theme verse for my life. It's like when I think of manhood, I think of uh, God chose Abraham to do something for him first before he ever brought about the promise. And so if you look at most men, they want this promise. Uh-huh. They don't want to have the responsibility. And so I always tell people God brings the responsibility before he ever brings the promise. And that's how I kind of live my life. I, I mean, I take it really seriously with the kids I mentor, with the students that I, I have to impact. Like I have to overcome my, you know, my fears, like I don't like fundraising, I'm scared of it. But at a certain point, it's like when people meet me, they don't know it because it's like I, I just I'm just blunt about it. Like, hey, I need this for these kids, and so yeah, I started becoming a different man when I started realizing if I live life for other people to help other people and for God's glory, I won't have all the anxiety, all the scary, you know, all the hey, I'm shy, I'm scared of this, I'm scared of that. I was like, you know, at a certain point, a man just got to get the job done. You don't have time yeah. to be, you know, I'm scared of something. You just got to go for it. Purpose. Purpose. Eyes on the mission. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up here. But the, the story that you just told, it, it's so – so we talked the last couple of episodes. We talked about eliminating hurry. Mm-hmm. And if – if and kind of the key phrase there, if, if the devil can't make you sin – He'll make you busy. And your story that you just shared there, you could have been, hey, I know how these NFL scouts think. I know what they're looking at. I can't miss these opportunities. So I, I'm, I'm going to put the mission that God has put out to me on the back burner, and I'm going to go all in. But you said at the beginning of your story, God's going to teach you some things. And you, you said the word obedience several times. And that's so important and so crucial because – how many times does our flesh take over and we get panicked and we get anxiety 
and we feel like the the world is is caving in on us. And I go back to the example of of Jesus' disciples, like waking Jesus up, like Jesus, you need to get up. Like there's people, there's a line out here. You need to go heal all these people. He's just like, man, yeah, hey, we we're gonna do that. They they're gonna get healed. I just I'm gonna take my time. And you took your time in that experience. You know what I'm saying? Like you had your eyes on the prize, and, and you're just whatever like the fact that you brought your your ransom business cards and that was what you were most concerned about like hey am i gonna have a, like a just stack of soggy sweaty sock cards to hand out after this but, you know and god paved the way like I, that is so important and i think we miss i know we miss that because just the grind of the day and it stacks up and the weight gets so strong and i think the promise is that I know the promise is we don't have to let that weight stack up. God's always there to deliver. And we don't have to be in this like chaotic end of the road before we ask for help to just stick your eyes on purpose and obedience. And it worked out for you. And and the path that you're on now, the mission that you have your eyes set on is greater than anything that the NFL could have provided that, you know, USA could have provided, UAB could have provided, you know, Sanford could have provided, but those are all great experience, which goes back to the first words you said, legacy, right? So you're doing it, man. And that that's the legacy that's there. So uh, before we walk away, what, what words do you want to, like, what is some life that you want to speak into? Let, let's hear what you got. Close this out, JT. So I, I would just tell people as a man, just go be a man. You don't have to be a macho man. You don't have to be the strongest guy in the weight room. You ain't got to be the man with the fancy car, all the money. Just handle your responsibilities. 